Hi everyone, good afternoon and thank you all for being here at today's event, Good Clothes, Fair Pay, Living Wages in the Global Fashion Industry. My name is Maeve Galvin, I'm the Policy Director here at Fashion Revolution and I also manage the forthcoming Good Clothes, Fair Pay project on living wages that we're going to talk about a little today as well. So today's panel discussion is part of this year's Fashion Revolution Week, and it links to our theme of money, fashion, power, which is all about trying to highlight the power imbalance that persist, that persists in the fashion industry, with the industry's profits being so concentrated in the hands of just a few actors at the expense of the millions of workers who fuel the industry, who are, of course, predominantly women. So we're going to get into a really in-depth discussion on living wages with our panelists shortly. We're going to capture a range of perspectives on why living wages are needed, why it's been so difficult to make them a reality for the folks that make our clothes, and whether legislation might be able to help. So I'll start off by introducing our very international and very esteemed group of panelists. Mario Ikovic is a clean clothes campaign activist and president of Nova Syndicate, a trade union in Croatia. Martina Marikova is the Fashion Revolution Country Coordinator for Slovakia. Nazreen Cheek is an international speaker, a survivor of modern day slavery and an advocate for global human rights. Waranta Jinting is the Deputy International Coordinator of the Asia Floor Wage Alliance. Marissa Nuncio is the director of the Garment Worker Center in California. Laura Walters, who'll be joining us later, is a member of the European Parliament and sits within the Socialists and Democrats group and is currently the rapporteur for new EU legislation on corporate due diligence and corporate accountability. And Julia Kirshner is the social impact manager at the German fashion label Armed Angels. So a big welcome to you all and we have lots to discuss. For those of you watching online, please do send in questions for specific panelists or even for the panel as a whole, and we'll try and get to them later. We'll have a little bit of time to answer them. Just before we kick off into the discussion itself, if you'll bear with me, I'd like to give you a brief preview of, our, of a campaign that we're launching in the summer called Good Clothes, Fair Pay. Um, so I'd like to just walk you to a few slides about that. Um, just let me share my screen briefly and pull up some slides on this. Hang on just a moment. Thank you. So Fashion Revolution and a coalition of partners, including Clean Clothes Campaign, Fair Wear Foundation, ASM Bank and many others, we're getting ready to launch a new European citizens initiative, which is called Good Clothes, Fair Pay. Next slide, please. Good Clothes Fair Pay is a new campaign demanding a living wage for the people who make our clothes. So as many folks watching will be aware, currently the majority of textile and garment workers can't afford to make ends meet, decent housing, access to healthcare, nutrition, education, all of these core elements of life are a struggle. Um, and our, the premise behind our campaign is of course that a living wage is not a luxury, it is a fundamental human right. Next slide, please. So specifically, the legislation that we're calling for would require EU-based garment, footwear and textile companies and brands selling products on the EU market to conduct due diligence on living wages throughout their global supply chain and show how they're closing the gap between living wages and actual wages, including how they're addressing those all important purchasing practices that we know impact upon, the, impact upon workers' wages. So the EU is the world's largest importer of clothing and textiles. So really we believe that it has the power and the responsibility to hold fashion brands accountable for the workers in their supply chain. And to make the legislation a reality, we're doing this in sort of an outside of a traditional campaign. So we're doing it via the mechanism of a European citizens initiative. And for those of you that aren't familiar with a European citizens initiative, it's a tool which, which compels the European Commission to consider action on an issue, as long as it has the support of at least 1 million EU citizens. So basically, this is a mechanism that will allow EU citizens to stand in solidarity with garment workers in Europe, but as well as around the world. 
Um, so from a campaign standpoint, this really needs to be, you know, as loud and as noisy as possible because we need a million signatures to push this to the European Commission and make our demands heard. We're going to be starting our signature collection in the summer. If you are an EU citizen, you can get directly involved. You can sign on to this campaign and help us get to a million signatures. And if you're not an EU citizen, we still need you because you can help us spread the word and do that all important work of sharing our content on social media and elsewhere. So if you're interested, you can find us on Instagram at Good Clothes Fair Pay. We also have a website, goodclothesfairpay.eu. And we're already sharing tons of information on wages and how to take action. So thanks everyone so much for listening and allowing me to preview our campaign. I hope you'll be hearing a lot more about it as we progress and we get going in the summer. So I'm now going to take us back to our fantastic panel and our larger panel discussion. So I think an excellent place to start is looking at this from a gender perspective. And luckily we have Nazreen here who's well placed to speak about that. So Nazreen, the majority of people who make our clothes are women. How do low wages impact women in particular? Thank you so much, May, for that. Such a great question. Um, I wish that question would have uh, been asked uh, 15 years ago and maybe my childhood would have not been stolen if that question would have asked 10 or 15 years ago. Um, I'm going to share my real experience what happens when, uh, when people don't have access to living wage. Like my father, he worked as a welder and he earned $7 a month. And when he earned $7 a month, he was not able to take care of me at the first space. And then in the second, like he could not even have access to clean drinking waters or nutritious food or anything. So that puts him into a very fragile conditions that ultimately pushed me to be involved and, 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 and be pushed in this industry. And I think I became a child labor uh, for textile factory when I was nine or 10 years old. And because the margin was so tight that my room was literally 10 by 10 with no windows, the door locked, and we were literally forced to work from 6 a.m. to all the way to 8, 9, 10, 11, and 12 p.m. And I want each and every one to imagine being nine or 10 year old and being forced to work 12 to 15 hours a day. What would you feel? You feel nothing. You don't feel a human. You feel like a machine, like a living machine that is forced to just do the work. If they could have provided a living wage for my father, I would have access to basic human rights. You know, I would have access to education. And because I didn't have that, I'm living today my life with trauma. And, and not only my own trauma, but the trauma of my ancestors. And this is a very, a huge crisis that is happening in underserved communities all over the world. And it deeply affects women and girls because in these spaces, mostly are women, as there are over 40 million people in slavery. 70% of them, of them are women and girls. And not only that, our birth certificates, like my birth was never recorded. So I don't even know how old I am. And, uh, and I want you to imagine, like if your birth rights are taken away from you, could you apply for you know, school? Could you go to school? Could you open a bank account? Could you even apply for a good job? So these uh, systematically, um, our um, underserved communities are kind of like we are very lost and, and we are like, uh, especially in the indigenous communities also, we are like targeted somehow with the belief systems, with the poverty and, uh, and, and literally being forced to work in these conditions for, for all of our lifetime. And we, um, we never get um, access to our voice uh, because we don't get paid. And uh, just to talk a little bit about my own experience. So I work 12 to 15 hours a day, I'm receiving less than $2. 
um, I don't have clean water. I don't have nutritious food. Sometimes my foods in my food, I have bugs that uh, um, uh, as I would eat, I would find also lots of thread. And, uh, and I would sleep on the large pile of clothes that I was making because simply there's no bed in that sweatshop. So how can people imagine to, uh, to get people out of that situation? And there are millions of women and girls in that situation that I was. And um, I'm not a professional speaker or researcher, but I'm an experiencer and a, a, and a survivor. And I feel like it is very important for people to really give a space to survivors to share those experiences. So we can tell you that, you know, if you just pay $5 a day, that would change the whole scenario of our, our, uh, our experience instead of putting us into a $2. So uh, we could have access to clean water so we don't get like uh, disease or bacteria in our water. If we would have access to nutritious food, we will be not eating spoiled or outdated food. We would have safe shelters. And we right now, a majority of the people in the cities, in, in underserved communities, they are being congested in apartment with up to 10 people in a tiny room. And if you are congested with 10 people, all these COVID things are happening. People are calling social distance. It doesn't happen in our community. We can't do a social distance. So we cannot bring the colonialism in every aspect of our life. And we must open our heart and mind and spirit to include everyone. And I feel like the first start we can do is to start paying these workers at least a living wage so we can have a basic human rights. We are not asking for much, just for a basic human rights. So we can also drink clean water. We can also go to school and provide a better service to the planet and to the world. So um, I just feel like living wage is not just a fundamental basic human rights, it's the emergency right now. Because if we don't do that, we are already, we, a lot of people in my communities are dying. And, and I can give you so many stories of my own uncles who died at the age of 20 because he couldn't afford, he was forced to work when he was eight years old. And imagine working every single day for 15 hours a day and you're not eating your food, nutritious food, your eyes will, you will become blind eventually. And this is what happened to my uncle. He became a blind and then he became a dependent on the society for a while and then after that he passed away so like that so many workers are facing extreme challenges and they don't have a voice to speak up for themselves so we as a collective here are, are coming together and speaking for them um, i just feel like this is an emergency um, support that needed to provide these workers with at least basic living wage so we can attain our basic human rights thank you thank you nazarene i think that was an incredible way to kick us off really powerful really sobering and you're you're touching on so many issues that i'm sure other panelists are going to pick up on throughout the conversation really appreciate it um mario i'm going to come to you next because i think many people watching might be surprised or maybe not to learn that wage issues and poverty issues still exist within the EU itself. Can you give us an overview of the wage issues faced by workers within Europe? And specifically, can you talk about how easy or difficult it is for workers and their representatives to actually negotiate and get wage increases? Hi to everyone. Uh, yes, just like you already mentioned, in CCC, uh, in the last 15 years, we found out that there are no problems only in other continents, in Asia, America, South or Mid or, or Africa, but we also have problem in our neighborhood and we didn't see it before. Uh, in CCC, we started with a lot of research about 15 years ago, and now we have some dates, which are really important to know. 
in uh, Europe East and South East, we speak about two and two two point three millions of garment workers, and uh, the gap between minimum wages and living wage in different countries are very often even even bigger than in Asia, for example. Just to give you a few examples, in Moldova, we found that workers are working full time for only 15% of living wage. But also in Bulgaria, which is which is a European Union member state, <clears throat> we found that workers receive only 19% of living wage for full-time work in garment industry. This is, I think, uh, something what everybody has to know. Okay, we found also very hard violences of workers' rights in other, but today we will be concentrated on wages, specifically living wage. Uh, if you ask how people can survive with such a low level of wages, uh, from our research, we found that this is, <clears throat> this is the first and the most important reason why in garment industry we have a lot of overtime. But unfortunately, very often overtime is not paid or it is not fully paid like it, it would have to be if you if you want to to pay legally it has to be uh, probably 50 percent more in 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 many countries but uh, workers very often don't get it uh, then uh, we also have examples that people try to find some other jobs which they work in the afternoon, if they work in the morning in factory. Uh, unfortunately, we found a lot of workers which, which take loans and uh, just go to debts. And it is never ending story. They cannot come out from such a situation in their life because they, they will never earn enough if we will not do something for them. And uh, also, we found it as uh, maybe the most important reason why we have uh, really a lot of migrants from Eastern and Southeastern countries in Europe to Western countries. I think uh, I will give an example from my country when we entered the European Union, we lost already about 15% of all citizens. But this 15% is much more if you if you see how many young people went out. It means it's really something what we cannot, uh, it, 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 it is something what we, we have to stop. Uh, for that reason in, uh, in CCC, we started to work also on living wage uh, strategy. Uh, first of all, we created a new benchmark called Europe floor wage. Uh, we had Asian floor wage as example and older brother of, of our campaign. Now it is campaign. And I can say that uh, already now we can say that we have some successes and workers really support such an idea. idea. And I think uh, with, uh, with this benchmark and just to raise awareness around the, the whole these countries about what is living wage, living wage is human rights. You really, you really have to receive such an amount of money if, if your state wants to be normal state. Uh, but we also think, and it's already started, we empower trade unions in negotiations. I can say that from our experience in Novi Sindicat, we already used uh, 
Europe floor wage in negotiations, and really we had in okay, unfortunately not in garment. You know, situation in garment is uh, uh, in COVID time was really terrible here, but in some other industries we increased salaries for thirty percent. What what is really a lot and never happened before. It means that work on living wage already started and we are really happy in CCC uh, that we joined to uh, your initiative. And I think we will have success and we really have to find a way how to, how to really uh, give to workers opportunity to survive. Because in, Today we have situations that they really, I already told, they they find their way to survive, but these ways are not enough. Uh, just to also say that uh, in Europe we found that minimum wages today in East and Southeast Europe cover about 60% of poverty line. Which is also, you know, if if we speak in, in European Parliament about decent wage, how anybody can say that these minimum wages are decent if they are really much lower than poverty line? Yeah. Thanks so much, Mario. And you touched on so many issues that I want to come back to, but I think maybe the key <laughs> ones that I'd like to get more from you on are, you mentioned debt and you obviously mentioned COVID, where brands yeah. cancelling their orders obviously led to huge levels of wage disruption and wage theft and essentially a humanitarian crisis among workers. If we had living wages in place, would there be any form of insulation um, before, you know, a potential crisis or an unexpected event like COVID if it were to happen again? Yeah, uh... First of all, to also to give information from, from our data. For example, we in Croatia, uh, with factory clo closures, we lost 15% of garment workers in last two years. Uh, okay, maybe, maybe this percent is, is not so huge in more productive countries like Romania or Turkey, but uh, we are already, you know, too expensive. <laughs> we 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 can uh, we can earn even five hundred euros in one month in garment industry, which is maybe for some brands it's, it's really too expensive in this moment. Uh, I think uh, uh, for next crisis. Uh, yeah, I, I forgot to give one more information about Euro floor wage, which is connected to this issue. Uh, this is just like Azure floor wage, cross-border benchmark. It is very important because it is also struggle against uh, competitivity with lower prices. Uh, we have to do it not in one country, not in two countries, but in the whole region. In whole Europe, we have to establish, and this is the way we just now started with this campaign. If we if we will fight for uh, for living wage on you know everywhere in the world, exactly. But uh, then uh, this part of you know because in in crisis, uh, employers tried to find cheaper places again. They did it in history, but once again. Uh, if uh, we will have success to connect workers also over the borders uh, with such initiatives, then it will not be possible. And of course, you know, uh, people, uh, garment workers will be, will have better status at all. If you receive living wage, of course you can survive. Uh, I will give you an example now when we lost some, some uh, working places because of COVID. Uh, 
Of course, we have also problems to for workers to get severance, but we have success with in, in this fight with employers and brands. Finally, finally, almost all workers will receive severance. But this severance will be, I today I, I made some mathematics, you know, because because wages are very low. Uh, severance in our country is only two and a half decent wages. You know, what is it? It's, it's not enough to survive until you, you will find a new job or, and, and you, you, you are all already in debt before you are fired. It means uh, for sure with, with living wage, uh, people will be, you know, in much better situation in, in any new crisis. Thanks, Mario. And I think you you keyed us up quite nicely to talk to Waranta because you've referenced Europe floor wage um, as well as Asia floor wage quite a lot. And I think, Waranta, when people are new to this living wage topic, they're coming in and they're kind of asking why are there different methodologies and calculations? And it almost seems like a bit of a minefield. Can you give us an explanation of what Asia floor wage is and why we need it? Thanks, Mary. So Asia floor wage is a concept. I mean, it's a methodology for determining living wage. And it, this being developed uh, for several, after several years through research and discussions within the trade union workers. And then it finally launched in 2009. And then just like Mario explained earlier, I mean, the Asia floor wage is cross-border living wage. And it is not only cross-border, but it's also cross-border women-centered living wage for garment workers. And then, as we know, I mean, we are saying like living wage, it means like it is higher. I mean, it is above the minimum wage. Because, I mean, we understand like the minimum wage is the poverty wages. And then with the garment workers receive right currently right now, I mean, the poverty wages, the minimum wages, is it's not enough to support the workers and the family to have an adequate standard of living. I mean, we Nasrin experience stories, Mario stories. I mean, that's it's really repeating again and then again in the garment industry. And then it's the garment industry is very, very not very, very infamous with these terrible working conditions. But still, we know that I mean. The garment industry is being hailed like a pathway to end of poverty, like a pathway to the economic growth. And then we can that, but still, I mean, people, the women garment workers, I mean, are living in poverty. So, so this is the situations why we need the living wage why we need the Asia floor wage, more like, I mean, that's what we propose. So this should be higher than the minimum wage, than the legal minimum wage. I mean, but then how to calculate it? So the Asia floor wage concept, uh, there are three components in Asia floor wage concept methodology in determining the living wage. One is cost of food. Food, every family, I mean, the workers' family, I mean, allocate, a significant amount of money to buy food but i mean what kind of food we are we are using the unit of calorie so asia floor wage concept proposed like i mean an an adult worker will need 3000 calorie i mean if we if we see uh, the recent publications of ilo i mean last year i mean just recently published and then they take the calorie intake for adult workers is 2950 it's pretty close with the asia progress proposal so and then the 3000 calorie is important because i mean we then go survey the workers family how much the consumptions of the workers family every day do they reach 3000 calorie no do they reach i mean the ilo standard 2009 1950 no i mean there is a gap big gap and then that will be the problem 
that's mean like they're only receiving the minimum weights and then they cannot reach the 3000 calorie standard and then the, the second component is non food cost like the non food cost is housing healthcare clothing utilities uh medical care education for children rest and recuperation time social and cultural opportunities and then just like i mentioned earlier i mean asia floor waste is a women center living waste because i mean we took we take into account the child care and domestic work so this also need to be considered in the living wage so this is non food cost and then the third component is i mean a family the wage the living wage should be account based on the consumption unit of three consumption unit i mean we consider like one family should have like three consumption unit one consumption unit is one adult consumption unit and then the children it will be half consumption unit so it can be like one bread one breadwinner one earner and then two dependents and then dependents can be like one adult or like two children i mean that's like three consumption unit and if, if we go refer to again i mean recent ilo publications i mean they refer to like consumption unit i mean through four family member so i mean the the asia floor weights i mean been discussed since 2007 and then being launched in 2009 and then recently it kind of like some of the component of it i mean refer to what asia floor has been done for been more than 10 years so i mean that's how to calculate the living wage and then the amount of the figure is above the minimum wage so why we need it because i mean this will be like the basic amount for the workers to live in adequate living and it's not only the workers but also their family members i mean we we see we want to end this poverty i mean if the means of the economic growth that the garment industry need to be can end the poverty and then can more like empowering women workers i mean the living needs need to be applied i will stop there Thanks, Samaranta, for that really comprehensive overview. And I think what you've captured really well is just the fact that a living wage should be a floor, not a ceiling, that it covers the basics and some discretionary income. Um, but in a practical sense, Mario mentioned earlier that in other sectors, um, the European floor wage is being used on the bargaining floor. Are we seeing that in Asia and in garments? Um, it doesn't sound like the European counterparts um, or having much success with it, but it'd be great to hear your perspective on how Asia floor wage is actually being used um, by workers and the representatives. This is more like, I mean, why we are using, I mean, this is like Mario mentioned earlier, I mean, this is regional. And then why we are doing the regional, because I mean, we understand like, I mean, the, mean, the wage struggles at the country level has a limitation. We understand like, if one country raised the minimum wage and then there is a threat from the brands, I mean, they will give order to another country. I mean, this is a sustainable rest to the bottom that keep workers in poverty. And then most of them in the government sector are women workers. So we understand this, we realize this. I mean, this cannot be a struggle at the country level. That's why we need to have like a collaborations across country that all the trade unions workers workers rights organizations in the social movement in the labor movement trade union movement to come and then to bargain at the industry levels at the regional level i mean that's why mario said i mean the europeans bargain in the regional levels and then the asia begins in the asia levels and then this is not an easy way i mean it's been a long path for Asia floor weights, more than 10 years. And then, I mean, it's just recently, I mean, last year, I mean, we launched, I mean, with partners at the global level, with CCC, WSR, and we launched the Wage Forward campaign. The Wage Forward campaign is more like to bring all labor movement actors, the social movement, and then the trade union movement to come together and then bear gain with the industry, with the brands, put them into enforceable binding agreement with them. So being like, I mean, it, whether it's success, it's it's ongoing process and we are keep pressuring, we are going building the power to do the bargain.
with the brand. That's my say. Thanks so much. I'm going to shift gears a little bit now and I'm going to come on to Martina. Martina, thinking about this with a campaigner's hat on, I know the question that always comes up again and again for us is when we're communicating to citizens and consumers, that is, is if workers are paid a living wage, will it lead to higher clothing prices? So how do you respond to that? So well, um, first of all, I think we should ask ourselves if uh, what we are paying, uh, what we, sorry, what we are paying uh, in in shops for garments, if that's the if that's the correct and right price for for what we are getting, and uh, um, if this is the price what we would pay our family and friends if they were garment workers. I always say, like, imagine your family being on that side. How would you react to that? Like, make it personal. Um, after after hearing what Nasreen said, I mean, I'm, I'm even more angry about how it work, works right now. And uh, um, I would really appeal on people to to think about prices like high street uh, brands, maybe compare it with the local designers uh, who who whose work they can see, who they work they can check, and then they can see the amount of the work what goes into making clothes. If you don't know how to do it, go in a, like whatever workshop and try to make your own clothes. And you will see, you will not say at the end of the workers, oh yeah, I, I, at the end of the workshop, I would be paid. I would sell you this for a few cents, no way. Um, this is actually a technique we use with the children when we are making clothes. So they appreciate the price, the price of it. So even when you have brands with higher um, prices of clothes, of their garment, of their products, uh, then you see huge sales and they're still able to make a profit. So all this that just doesn't make a sense. That does, at the end, it doesn't add up. Add up. So um, I would really appeal on everyone, let's stop calling it affordable prices, what we have, and let's call it what it is. It's, it's underpriced. <laughs> it's not the real price of what it is. So even now, considering high inflation and uh, negative impact of pandemic, uh, uh, on the working condition and pay of uh, garment workers, I think uh, it's even more crucial to revise pricing of garment and to see a little bit into how are the what in these prices and what are the profit profit margins. So, so to see a little bit of breakdown and um, where this reflects. Uh, I want I want to say one sort of good example or good case or positive thing uh, in Pakistan, in a province, uh, Sindh, I hope I pro pronounce it correctly. Um, there was this um, labor rights advocates and they were, after many years, they persuaded the government uh, to increase the stat uh, statutory minimum wage from, in US dollars, it was 100 US dollars to 142 US dollars. It started um, uh, last year, uh, but then, um, this was sus suspended by local Supreme Court. And then after going back and forth and back and forward, at the end, the, the Supreme Court declared that the increase of minimum wage should be, uh, should be approved and it was 142 uh, US dollars. It was, uh, I think February or March this year, it was the final, final <clears throat> decision taken. But this, if this uh, transfers into the prices of the garments, it's only a few percent in the price of the garment. And then if you imagine that garment worker wages are going up to 40%, 40% higher, and this is only a few percent increase in the price of the garment, I have nothing else to add. So um, then the question is who would, who, who would uh, or where would this, uh, this increase, who would be paying for this increase? And here <clears throat> uh, I have to say we are uh, very privileged and we had things too cheap for too long. And somehow uh, we take it as, a, as a, our right to have things cheap and to have it affordable and to have it uh, to, and to be able to get them whatever we want. And I think this is also on the consumer side, this is something to we need to learn society that that's not how we should be working because there is other side of it. So for I think there are two two sides who who should um, absorb the co higher cost of the clothing. One side is the customer, and other side is uh, is a brand because as you can see, their margins, uh, there are huge profits. And considering how much um, 
how much negative impact the production has this pro and the fashion industry is producing and only few are benefiting from it and then the whole all society has to pay and uh, and deal with uh, uh, human rights abuse and environmental abuse uh, i think this is not far from a sort of um, criminal activity or how to call it is like like when few people are doing things this wrong and it's so visible, it, this is what makes me angry that we are not able. And this is really to all policymakers because I don't know why at this age, at this time, we even have to make some petition, petitions for people. Sorry, I'm... Uh, no, this, this is why we what, need it. <laughs> oh, okay. So um, as a, as a consumers, we just need to think more, buy less and buy better. That's that's a simple map. And then you can justify the higher price of the garment. Then it's it's easy. Thanks so much, Martina. A real call to action there. And, and as someone who has tried and failed to operate a sewing machine on many occasions, I'm totally with you. It is absolutely skilled labor that needs to be adequately and very well compensated. I'm going to move to Lara now because I think Lara, we're really glad to have you with us. And for those of us looking at what's happening in the policy space, we've obviously had a lot of developments at EU level, the Corporate Sustainable Due Diligence Directive and the EU textile strategy. These are far from perfect, but they're essentially groundbreaking moves in terms of addre really addressing corporate behavior at EU level. Um, but I suppose the big question is like, why now? And why is it at this moment in time that policymakers are taking on these issues? Um, why now is, I think the, the, the accumulation of so many examples that are very um, tangible, very in our face about the, the outsourcing of the discontents of our consumption patterns. I think that um, it's been a long time coming. And I think that at the moment, what we've got is a, a sort of a get together of, of, of outrage over um, the, 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 the consequences of, of our, our behavior, of Western behavior, let's say, in, in the rest of the world, and, and, and very rightly so. And I think at this point in time, policymakers have realized uh, too late, uh, let's be honest, but have realized that that the way in which we we um, in which we we consume, the way in which we outsource the the, the production of many of our our products um, is is not sustainable and has consequences. Um, I think that consumers realize that you know uh, buying a T-shirt that costs five euros surely uh, surely cannot be right, and that there's a a true cost to things. I think that things like Twitter and social media and TikTok videos have made people more aware of the actual goings on in, in factories and sweatshops. Unfortunately, you know, disasters like Rana Plaza have made, um, you know, have, 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 have documented very well and made it very, very tangible and, and visible to people um, what is going on elsewhere to, to um, you know, create the everyday world that for so many people in, in, in Europe, at least, is, um, you know, is the, the, um, yeah, the the status quo that before wasn't wasn't questioned. So I think it's a a, um, a a moment in which all these things are coming together. I think that there's there's consumers who are demanding more. There's policymakers who are now aware that actually the time really is now to make changes because we cannot continue living like this. And I think this is the first time that the the consequences of outsourcing some of these problems are, are really becoming tangible for policymakers and, and, and them actually thinking about their own children and their grandchildren, that sort of thing. Um, I think it's a time in which there's there's a mounting pressure from NGOs, from, from trade unions, and that they are probably able to, to organize themselves more because these, these examples like Rana Plaza and others are now sort of lodged in policymakers' brains. Um, so I think that that um, it's it's uh, many things together, but the, the important thing is it is here now finally. And as you said, we've got two proposals on the table now that will hopefully, at least if I can help it, will make a real change. Thanks, Lara. And I have to follow up with a bit of a self-serving question, but do you think the EU are ready to legislate on living wages? <laughs> 
I think the EU are ready to uh, break with business as usual. I think that the EU are ready to do things that five years ago were maybe seen as impossible and that were seen as too uh, anti-business. I think there really is a sort of new wind here in Brussels. And of course, there's a massive difference between what the left and what the right wants and what conservatives and what, what um, a socialist wants. But I think that everyone at least is aware now that, that something's got to give and that we cannot continue consuming um, in the way that we do and that we cannot continue outsourcing um, things to somewhere where it's where it's more out of sight. So I do have high hopes of the due diligence directive. So that's a duty of care uh, law that I will be responsible in the European Parliament that obliges companies essentially not to look away and that obliges them to go and dig into their value chains and to see what is actually going on on the ground in the case of the textile garment industry um, in factories that obliges them to talk to NGOs, to journalists, that obliges them to talk to trade unions and workers um, and to help them or to, to ask them also to help design um, the, the the control processes and 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 the the, the scrutiny of those value chains um, in a way that is effective and that is useful. Um, so I have I have high hopes of this law seeing the light of day um, because I think that there is a broad consensus of the need for it. I am more concerned about what the law will look like in practice, and what I mean with that is. Um, how sharp will the teeth be? How, how sharp will sanctions be if companies don't do their due diligence properly, if they don't go and proactively look for the problems in their supply chains, look for the situation on the ground when it comes to workeries and garment factories? Um, that's a question. There's another important question, which is the question of uh, liability. Uh, liability, where does liability st start and end? Where does responsibility start and end? And all those questions will politically be huge battles here but i have high hopes that we will get to a law i have high hopes that it'll be a law that will oblige companies not to look away and to dig into those value chains what i am worried about is that um what uh, what we need here of course and it's been very well described um before what we need is not just minimum wages uh, not just wages that that are that are uh, that are in line uh, perhaps with 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 the very minimum uh, minimum legally speaking, what we need is, is is decent wages and living wages, and that I think is something where we'll need a combination of legislation here that is in line with ILO uh, standards and and so forth. But what we also need is huge um, pressure from all those others involved in this space, you know, NGOs and consumers and so on, um, to not only let companies follow the letter of the law, but let's say also the spirit of the law and go that extra mile, not only to make sure that they provide uh, wages that are legally prescribed, but also to see if those wages actually make sense on the ground and allow people to live a dignified life. And I think that there's a a difference between those things, um, and it's one that, of course, um, uh, that 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 uh, many of the big makes are are aware of. But it's a question for many of them also of, of putting their money where their mouth is now. Thanks so much, Lara. Finding your high hopes very encouraging, and certainly in terms of that accountability piece you describe, I don't think you'll have any shortage of activists on this call and elsewhere who um, will will hold back on um, providing that pressure that you describe. So I'd like to come to Julia now. I think it's really important that we have a brand perspective on the panel. Um, and obviously, Armed Angels can't speak for every single brand out there, but I think it'd be great to hear about your specific circumstances. So, Julia, I'd love if you could break it down for us. How easy is it for a smaller brand like Armed Angels to address living wages in your supply chain? Yes, thank you. I, I wouldn't say it's easy. <laughs> But it's definitely also not as complicated as it's uh, pictured. It might be really complex, but it's not as complicated as it's often, you know, shown um, or shown by brands, um, basically. But uh, first things first is um, we don't pay wages directly because we don't own any factories. And I think this is really important to also understand for consumers. However, we obviously we pay prices for the garments that we buy from our suppliers. And these prices need to be fair and need to enable our supplier to then pay a fair wage to the, the garment workers. Um, what you know sounds like really common sense, but this is really, <laughs> I mean, this is the basis of what we're of what we're talking about. And 
as armed angels, we've um, implemented a method which we, I think it was already 2017. So this has uh, been implemented for quite a while and it's quite a robust system for us, which we call an open costing methodology. And this is rolled out uh, throughout our supply chain partners um, where we look at prices very transparently and we don't negotiate on prices in an empty room, which is still, you know, common um, uh, yeah, thing to do, negotiating prices, uh, but rather to calculate prices, which sounds simple enough, but really it also is. If you have a very good, you know, trusting and good work relationship with your supplier, you can definitely reach this level um, um, and, and, and simply add up all the components. So talking about, you know, fabric prices, accessories, trims, um, artwork, finishing, everything that, you know, makes up a, a product, obviously also uh, looking at overhead costs and profit margins for the factory, but also, and most importantly, also looking at labor costs very transparently and openly. So we have a system where we uh, discuss um, or calculate labor minute costs um, every six months with each supplier. And we have full transparency into, um, of course, legal minimum wages in, in the respective countries, but also every average wages of each supplier, as well as, uh, as uh, average overtime, because this is really correlated um, as we've uh, heard already today. Um, we also know sick days, we know idle time. We have this whole you know, system um, to, to calculate labor minute costs and, um, yeah, and basically look at uh, capacity minutes that a, um, a, a t-shirt garment needs um, to be produced and then incorporating that transparently into the price of, of each of our garments. Um, and we also look at um, wages of each of our supplier and we calculate what we call a fair paid level where we look at where is our supplier standing in terms of legal minimum wages compared to average wages actually being paid and that's uh, ranging, obviously, um, uh, whether a partner has a collective bargaining agreement in place or not. Um, and there we can really, you know, look at pain points. Uh, and especially if you look at overtime as well, and you realize um, where, where you have correlations, where you really need to you know, su uh, support your supplier with this. Um, and this is really the basis for all the work on wages is that you really have this transparent knowledge on of, of, of data and um, uh, the the status quo of your suppliers and that's um, that's really important um, to have that throughout everything and then you can really work on on pain points and and su support suppliers so we have one um, project which is rather new uh, in place which is well like Kind of a lighthouse project for us um, on on living wages that is coming on top of this you know broad uh, um, you know way of of working with our suppliers is a living wage project which is rather unique um, in that sense that we are not doing this alone but with four other brands and this is where you know the you know joint joining forces is really coming in uh, everybody's talking about transparency and disclosing publicly disclosing suppliers and how this is you know um, critical for many, I think many brands don't want to do this, but I really see, especially in this project, I see how, how all brands and suppliers can benefit from, you know, join, joining forces. And so basically in this um, project, uh, we have four brands. This is Nudie Jeans and Mini Rodini and Kings of Indigo. We have a shared supplier and we um, came together. We have a leverage of around 80 to hundred percent. So we can really make a difference together and um, we've been talking for a while with the supplier. Uh, they were very, in, yeah, very engaged, very happy to work with us on, on this. And uh, they did extensive research again with their workforce, uh, looking at their living situation, their family situation, their income situation, and so on and so forth to really set this up properly, properly and fair to the workers. Uh, and uh, yeah, last, week, last year in December, we were able to pay the first living wage bonus to the workers covering 100% of the wage gap. Uh, and again, we had a second payment now in March covering the first quarter of the year. Uh, and we are already um, scaling up and seeing where, uh, where we can take this project and also how we can roll it out to other suppliers where 
support is uh, more needed. So yes, no, definitely not easy, uh, but uh, not at all impossible even for smaller brands. Good to hear that. And that you touched on it briefly, but I'd just like to ask you a little bit more about that piece on leverage. What do you do, you know, if the four of you come together and you have 82 percent and that's that's kind of strong muscle. Um, but what do you do in the places where you don't have that, especially as a smaller brand? Yes, that's um, that's that's really where you, you need to lean on the support of uh, of more than one customer. So usually we have around five to 10 percent of leverage. And then obviously you can also only account for that percentage um, um, of, of the wage gap. So this is really, um, really difficult to then make, you know, one one specific uh, action there. So you always have to, as a smaller brand, um, not having a, a huge leverage, it, it really does make sense to come together with us, other customers, especially if they are also Fairware Foundation member brands. Obviously, this makes it much easier. But also with other brands, uh, really any any brand, we would we would work with kind of any brand together on these projects because we not only in terms of wages, but in in terms of any you know, human rights due diligence, it, it's just, um, you have so many fantastic ripple effects. So yeah, um, definitely uh, working together on this is, is, is much, uh, much needed uh, for smaller brands. But um, yeah, seeing that we can make a, a huge difference already by implementing open costing, and this you can do as a brand, you know, no matter how small or big you are, if you have a good relationship with your suppliers this is something that you can implement basically uh starting you know today okay so not easy but doable um and could legislation on living wages which you know creates that often talked about level playing fields could that help the likes of armed angels in this effort of course i mean the the big the big thing you were saying it it's, it's really leveling the playing field not only for us brands but also for suppliers who are um, you know, somewhat fearing that their business will, you know, their customers will um, start sourcing somewhere else if they have, to, uh, if they are increasing wages and, and therefore have to increase prices. Um, and it, it, it's often also about trust and distrust, right? But if you, if you have good le legislations, you know, having a legal framework for that can an absolutely level playing field and, and make uh, implementation of, of better wages much much easier uh, for both brands and suppliers. Thanks so much, Julia. Um, so I want to come to Marissa now in the hope that um, what you and your colleagues and the workers of California achieved will inspire the rest of us. Mm -hmm. um, for anyone who doesn't isn't aware of the Garment Worker Protection Act, can you give us an overview and particularly what it achieved in terms of the take home pay of workers? Great, yeah, um, thank you for having me. Yes, um, uh, the Garment Worker Center organizes with LA, our Los Angeles garment workers. Um, and um, we waged a two year campaign uh, to pass the Garment Worker Protection Act, which did two main things. Um, it imposes um, liability on fashion brands for wage theft, for unpaid wages. Um, and it also eliminated uh, the piece rate. So it eliminated the, the ability to pay by piece unless a union, um, unless there's a collective bargaining agreement where workers actually have the power to negotiate their piece rates. Um, but by and large, there's almost no union density in the US, or very little union density in the US garment industry and especially in Los Angeles. Um, and that was passed uh, last fall. Um, it also, in, you know, sort of had provisions to expand um, our Bureau of Field Enforcement or our inspection arm and it, to expand their authority to issue citations against fashion brands where, um, where wage theft was found. Um, so, you know, we're very excited um, to pass this, um, you know, workers, when our, you know, it was our members that were the, you know, the front line of workers fighting for this, for this bill. Um, and when, when, you know, it was, you know, multiple years of sort of like planning and developing and researching and, you know, in preparation for launch of the campaign. And initially, um, because of what we've all been discussing, you know, brand uh, liability was the heart of our bill. 
Um, but workers said, we have to have that. We have to have, you know, we have to hold those at the top that are controlling so much of, um, you know, the, the sort of cash flow and the supply chain and ultimately have so much power over our wages. Um, you know, we, ha we have to hold them liable. But every day when we walk into the factory and if I were to name what's exploiting me, it's the piece rate. It's being made to earn my livelihood two cents at a time, three cents at a time for each seam that I sew or, you know, garment that I press. Um, and, you know, they said, you know, it, we have to have both, you know, that's the kind of daily kind of on the micro level of, of what we're experiencing. And um, we knew that that was going to be a really huge um, challenge to, to pass a bill that was that big, it was considered very big and controversial. Um, but workers did it by, you know, they, they did it by, you know, waging a massive public speaking and media campaign um, and just, you know, centering their stories, just, uh, you know, um, as Nazreen so powerfully said, just, you know, having their, just having the courage to tell it, you know, to their, their electeds, you know, to, and um, to, to organizations and unions to build broad support for, for this bill. And um, so as of January this year, it went into effect. And what that means is that workers, you know, um, who on a piece rate were earning an average of like six to seven dollars an hour, which um, if we quantify that in terms of the gap between, you know, those wages and the living wage, for a family of four, that's about 37 percent of the living wage. So that, you know, workers are absolutely um, earning poverty wages. What that means is they're, that's no longer the case. They have to earn $15 an hour, which is our current minimum wage locally. Um, we are hearing from our members, excuse me, is there some noise outside? We are hearing from our members that um, slowly but surely we are seeing factories eliminating the piece rate and, you know, paying according to the minimum wage, either by the hour or by the week, which is allowed as long as, you know, you're paid um, by the minimum wage. So we are seeing that slowly but surely, you know, as we all know, policy is key, um, but it doesn't change things overnight, right? It, it you know, it's a shift over time. Um, and so we've moved from this policy campaign to a pretty uh, robust education and outreach campaign so that workers know what their new rights are, um, but also so that businesses know what their new obligations are. Um, and, you know, I'm really, um, I, I think a, the shift that's happened in holding fashion brands accountable um, has left a lot of the industry sort of like, we're not sure what to do with this, you know? And I think that um, on the supplier level, we think that there needs to be more investment locally from our government, but also like, I think from organizations like ours to support suppliers in knowing how to enter into those conversations with fashion brands to say, hey, you know, um, your costing is not sufficient. This is what our costs are. Um, and you could be held liable, right? If, you know, your costing isn't allowing us to, to pay minimum wage and overtime and you could be held liable. Let's figure this out before a wage claim comes forward against us both, right? Um, and so I think that's gonna be like, a, you know, another sort of emphasis for us to support, um, especially small businesses to be able to do that. Um, but those are the pretty, you know, the, I think we're still, you know, we're, we're very focused on enforcement right now and making sure everybody understands the law um, that sometimes we maybe don't always feel how sort of, let, you know, how, significant this this gain was but um we are really excited about it and it has inspired um legislation elsewhere and now we're looking at potentially um uh federal legislation to make this consistent across the country because right now this only protects california garment workers 
That's really exciting that it could go federal and congratulations to you and your colleagues for all that's been achieved. I think, you know, for those of us in other parts of the world, you know, we're looking at these wins and obviously our questions are around how do we replicate? Um, what lessons do you think there are for future campaigns and campaigns elsewhere that could be replicated? Well, I could start by answering, you know, I think that, you know, if I think if, if we try to um, name what was successful in this campaign, um, it was centering worker stories as the key point of education for those who were going to vote on this law. Um, most of our legislators in California knew nothing about the garment industry, didn't even know it still existed in California, you know, just really that, you know, there was a lot of education to do. Um, and, and by centering worker stories, I think they really, you know, and especially really highlighting the piece rate and, and really highlighting, think about what that means to earn your livelihood two cents at a time. Just think about what that means. Um, and we also really emphasize really strong, um, just consistent coalition building. Um, we knew that our, we would face a lot of opposition from the industry and we did, um, but we, so we countered that by building, you know, coalition with other organizations and trade unions, but also with ethical fashion businesses. And we knew that this would be key. We know that there's a growing body of ethical fashion business like Arm Angels, right? That they're, you're out there and you're trying to change the industry from within. And we've seen a lot of growth of that in California. And we had this hypothesis that we haven't talked to each other in our 20 year existence, but maybe if we reach out and start talking to each other, we can find those aligned interests and we can fight together on this. And we ended up getting 158 business endorsers for our bill. So when the industry, with real old guard, you know, trade associations and when our, our chamber of commerce, which represents business in our state and cities, when they came forward and said, business hates this, all business will, you know, nobody in the industry wants this, we were able to counter and say, actually 158 businesses have endorsed. So that was really key. Um, and then finally, I would say, you know, it was unfortunate and, and not, you know, what, nothing that we expected, um, but the pandemic did has provided this, what we sort of call this conjunctural moment or this sort of like opportunity or more this moment that we had to take advantage of where eyes, um, there's more exposure, I would say, there's more eyes on what workers are going through. Um, there's a lot of talk in our country of, you know, essential workers, folks that had to work and were exposed to, you know, COVID. Um, the garment industry in LA County was the second hardest hit industry. Um, so it was one of the worst sites for outbreaks um, were in garment factories. Um, at the same time, you know, our city rolled out a plan, uh, this public plan called Los Angeles Protects, where garment workers were making masks, you know. And so it was workers were really talking about things and saying, if you're going to elevate us to essential worker status, you also have to elevate our labor standards. Like we won't accept less, you know? Um, and, you know, I, I don't think there's one single silver lining to this pandemic, but I was very moved by how workers so astutely, so strategically use that moment to really, you know, lay bare what, you know, workers said, this has always been a dangerous industry and unsanitary, you know, very, you know, unsanitary, cramped, horrible sweatshop conditions where COVID can run rampant and where this has always existed, but it's even worse now. And they use that moment, you know, as an education piece and a sort of a compelling, you know, story to, to persuade our electeds to make the right decision. Excellent. Thanks, Marissa. Um, so we're going to take a couple of the questions that have come in online from audience members. Um, one that's come in and it's directed to Julia, but I think others might have comments on it too, is 
many consumers might be worried that the payment of a living wage to garment workers will affect the price of a garment. Do you think that the costs could be absorbed elsewhere? Yeah, I think this was really uh, already touched on uh, by Martina, who also, you know, she, she said already quite uh, openly, like, is this the right price actually at the shops? Is this the true prices or who is actually paying the true price of this, uh, is this, is the, of this garment? And um, yeah, is the question is, are consumers worried or are, are brands also worried um, about their margins? Um, um, or that they can't sell as many pieces anymore if they're making it a bit more expensive and, and actually calculating these costs in. But also, as M Martina was already uh, also saying, um, is um, if you know the breakdown of a piece of garment, and we do, do know the breakdown of every single of our garments, and you look at labor costs, it doesn't make up the majority of the prices. Um, and um, yeah, so... Uh, it will not increase consumer prices um, by a lot. I think it could be covered by um, the majority um, of the brands. It could be covered by the margins because yes, brands earn a lot of you know, money by you know, buying cheap, selling <laughs> expensive. Um, so yeah, definitely this, uh, it, is, it is a point where I don't think consumers have to worry too much about higher prices. And if if they do, there is an important point that comes in, as I, th I think for brands like Armed Angels is, um, and I think Marissa touched on that just now as well, is the point of education. I think we need to educate the consumers um, in how a garment is made um, um, and what it, what it takes to make a garment and, and why this needs to have a proper price that reflects on the work, the, the manual work that went into making this garment. There's no machine that just spits out a t-shirt at the end. You know, this is real people working on it. And I don't think that many people still you know, realize that so much. It's an, yeah, it's a, it's a black box of an industry and people don't actually know what it takes to make a t-shirt. And if they knew, they would maybe appreciate the t-shirt more. I think this is uh, one of the things. And um, yeah, and also appreciate um, a, a bit of a higher price. So um, this is one of the points that we really see as one of the important, you know, tasks for us um, to to educate on on fair fashion, on on prices, on on the industry in general. Can I just add on that? Um, as a survivor of 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 this um, garment worker, what I experienced personally is how this whole supply chain of garment workers was so broken and so broken that like big factories were making just an agreement with big factories. Then they had like um, small factories, mini factories and mini factories had these individual rooms that they were using people like us, you know? So imagine if we can work on really understanding the whole measuring the supply chains and if there would be not so many middlemen involved in that uh, process, we will uh, cut down the price like like massive amount and then directly that extra money can go uh, to the workers who is, who is actually making those products. So what is happening is like there's way too many in people involved and this whole supply chain is so broken and so disconnected. And, uh, and, and on purpose, these massive companies, the fast fashion companies are keeping this whole supply chain broken. So they don't get to hear the story of, um, of undocumented child worker because they want to use those child laborers or, the, or those workers always pay them less than $2, you know? We don't care about them. Like whatever condition, the poverty, we label them, we make other stories and we don't tell and share the truth that, um, that how this whole system is broken to keep 1% and give the one percent all the profit so um i just want to encourage that all those companies who are going after the cheap uh these are basically fast fast fashion companies and these companies does not promote at all equality and it does not promote basic human rights and if people expect to purchase a new t-shirt for dollar five i want you to think you know that garment workers was paid to make for that t-shirt, how much they were being paid for that. 
So if we can question that and if we can map out our supply chain, we will be making good profit and also we will be serving those people, the workers in the front line too. So I just wanted to add that. Thank you. If I can add a few words. Sure. Uh, in preparation of the wage forward campaign, uh, we already made some calculations and it is really not a lot. Actually, now we haven't time to, to give all information, but uh, uh, I think that brands have reserves in the price already now to cover, to cover this gap. But I can say only as, also as consumer, I'm really ready to pay maybe 5% more for some shirt, but to be sure that workers will receive living wage. And I think most consumers think like this. Thanks, Mario. Another question that's come in is someone is saying, yesterday I showed the documentary Fashion Factories Undercover in class. That investigation was in 2016. Have living wages been improved in Bangladesh since then? I could direct this to Waranta because you'll obviously be familiar with um, the particular living wage situation in Bangladesh. But then if others want to come in, please do as well. Thanks, Maid. So just want to say, I mean, there is not so much of brands like Arm Angel. I mean, I mean, the big one out there, I mean, they say that they are paying living wage, but in practice, they don't pay living wage. Sometimes at the country levels, they kind of like play, I mean, they, their suppliers pay below living wage, below minimum wage, below legal minimum wage. So, and then in the questions of Bangladesh, I mean, the fight's still there. There is no living wage there. So if we differentiate, I mean, differentiate, I mean, the minimum wage, legal minimum wage and living wage, I mean, it's never been there. That's why the fight need to be continued. I mean, it's not only in Bangladesh, it's also in other countries. I mean, the sin in Pakistan, minimum wage, I mean, they bear gain back, I mean, not to pay the, the increase. That kind of situations, I mean, why, why this keep happening? Because, I mean, I'm, I'm Nasrin said greatly, I mean, like, the global supply chain is really broken. The global supply chains, it's mostly not regulated. It allows the brands to like to accumulate super profit through the great exploitations of the workers, the garment workers. So I mean that's how they are doing. And then what's what what is the situation? I mean what 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 what? If they, if, they, if they pay the living wage, whether they get bankrupt? No, I mean, they're not going to bankrupt. I mean, they already accumulate super profit. So, I mean, just like Mario explained, I mean, in the wage forwards uh, campaign, we said like, don't need like a really high increase. I mean, you just need to add more like 25% of the FOB go to the direct labor cost. So you need to increase that. I mean, then it will be the, the price of productions. I mean, the cost of productions will increase and then the government workers will receive a better decent living wage. So yeah, that's my I'll stop there. Thanks, Veranta. And I see Martini, you have your hand up. I would like to add, we are um, speaking about um, a production side, but uh, when we speak about brands, uh, Behind brands are always people, so they are not. Uh, when you when you call it brand, it gives it sort of anonymity. Who is behind it? Who are the faces behind it? So we should be more transparent about not just what is in production, but who is personally profiting from a certain product. And it's very easy. You just follow the money. Whoever has a profit, that's your answer. And there is no transparency in this. And I don't know why this is being so overlooked because it's easier to find uh, those few who are benefiting than to try keep exploring story of the garments. 
and, and, and trying to prove how wrong it is because there is also this other side and that's the side which should be probably uh, held responsible publicly. That's, that's my <laughs> Thanks so much. And I see your fellow panelists nodding along. Um, I'm just realizing the time is getting away from us and I think um, we're going to have to start winding down. But I would really like to ask um, to kind of do a bit of a round and ask all of your final thoughts um, on the topic and what role legislation could play in actually supporting bringing about living wages for workers in the fashion supply chain. And I suppose you could also comment on if there's specific issues that your kind of dream legislation um, would factor in um, to this. So, um, Mario, maybe I'll, I'll start with you because you're first in my chat box. Okay, I think the main question um, today is what do we ask for and for what we will make campaign. We have to know that this is fundamental human right. That is nothing more and it is really for me, it's silly that we have to campaign for it. It is something what should be, you know, normally asked from, from companies uh, without any legislation more, but okay, we need legislation. Uh, but I think uh, much harder will, will be after that to monitor and to implement legislation. I'm sure that we will collect signatures. Okay, I'm not sure that European Commission will accept everything what we propose, but something will happen. But in implementing and monitoring, we already now have problems with good laws somewhere but bad implementation and this is something for what we are ready to fight after thanks mario marissa i'll come to you next final thoughts from you um yeah i absolutely think that legislation has an important role to play um you know what i think is important however it, it is that it is coupled with organizing. It is coupled with workers' access to be able to monitor, to be able to be a voice in how it's being implemented or not being implemented. Um, you know, I always say like a law is really just, they're just words on paper, right? They're only it's as strong as its enforcement. They're only as strong as workers who know how to, um, you know, assert those rights. Um, and so, you know, they, they have to go hand in hand, but, um, but I don't want to sort of downplay the importance of legislation. I think that, you know, for us, we felt that, you know, we have been sort of waging campaigns against fashion brands that are, you know, have wage theft and horrible working conditions in their supply chain. And it's been, it's a moral argument. It's been this moral argument, you know, that if we just expose what's happening, they'll do the right thing, right? Eventually, we know not easily, but I, we found it's getting harder and harder to win those campaigns. And so for us, it was important to lift up the you know, the, the floor of what the, the standards were for liability, um, for brand liability, and sort of change that legal landscape. Um, and again, not expecting that it's some words on paper, we're going to change things overnight, but it changes the landscape within which workers are bringing forward you, their campaigns, right, it, or fighting their wage claims, you know. Um, and so I, I, I think that intersection between law and organizing can be extremely beneficial and strategic. So I do think it's very important. Excellent. Thank you. Julia, over to you. Yes, just to make looking at the time to make it really short. <laughs> I think it's um, yeah enough talk, really. Um, it's it's time to act and, and, and for everyone, really. So I'm, I'm looking at brands, I'm looking at consumers but also um, towards you know, governments. I think everybody uh, needs to you know, put their money where their mouth is. And uh, we had business as usual for far too long and now it's time to do business as unusual and might get uncomfortable, but like, uh, it, it's the time to do it for, for all parties really. Okay, let's get uncomfortable. Nazarene, would you like some final thoughts? 
Thank you. Oh my God, this is such an amazing <laughs> panel. Um, just once again, I feel like millions of garments workers are invisible and it is the biggest crime that is happening towards humanity. And I feel legislators and policymakers do have the power to make them visible because once we make them visible, that's how we can see the problem and that's how we all can come together to help each other. Because I deeply believe that in the end of the day, we are humans, you know, we are not machine, we are human. And my next th thought is um, that, you know, if you really care about uh, garment workers or any of the workers in any industry, please invest in them, you know, don't invest just money or just pay them, like go and learn about their cultures and traditions and how much time actually they spend in making or weaving your one carpet that you have in your home, you know, just connect on them or not even that, um, just like try to make one, <laughs> just try to make one t-shirt and see how it feels, you know, and when you go to a shopping mall, if you want to buy, please think about uh, beyond the price tag and consider those people who make your clothes and read the label, ask the questions. Um, you know, right now, all those people who are listening to this or hearing this, you are one of the most privileged one that you can understand. You have access to internet and computers that you can use to educate yourself and help those who are invisible. Because when I was stuck in the sweatshop, all I needed is help and an emergency help and long-term help. And one person stepped into my life that helped me give a voice. And now I'm able to help hundreds of people in my communities, you know? And we have these leaders in these grassroots organizations and they're looking for those mentorship and that, that partnerships. So invest in them and, 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 and share their works with them. Um, you know, we are done with competition. Um, I feel like female leadership is really going to empower the world. And so let's, let's not compete, but let's collaborate and be creative to, um, to change our world. And, you know, fashion industry is one of the second most polluting industry. And again, it affects the workers. And we all know that how uh, these communities are suffering deeply. And, uh, and COVID was a perfect example to connect us one more time. And if we don't see that, we will be facing another disasters one after another, and we are exhausted, and we are tired. And it's very simple to let go of competition and just connect. And we can connect with this shirt, one shirt that we buy today and think about obtaining one fair trade, you know, and then we can go and ask questions to so many other things that we have to figure out in our life. So thank you for having me. Maranta, very briefly, over to you. Hard act to follow, I know. Yeah, I mean, yeah, like I explained earlier, I mean, the government, global government supply chains mostly unregulated. And then legislations is the way to hold the brands legally accountable. Because I mean, they've been accumulating super profit for sometimes through the extreme exploitations of workers. And then they say they, they are not there. I mean, in, in Asia Floor West Alliance, we recently uh, launched a strategy, joint employer liability. Because I mean, in our frame, brands are not like buyers. I mean, that's how they frame themselves. I mean, they see themselves as a buyers. But they are not buyers as the open market buying things and then that's it. They don't care about what the production. No, they are not buyers. I mean, they are a joint employers with the suppliers. And then with that frame, hold them legally accountable to the labor violations. And then with this process, we also need with the legislation's process, we'll hold them accountable at, at the brand's home country. So they we need this legislation so to hold them accountable thank you and lara unfortunately has to leave us for another appointment so martina i'm going to give you the very last word so thank you um i just want to add uh, that in being in a fashion revolution campaign for many years i can see that awareness and education is is very important but it's not enough anymore Net legislation is a must at this point and i can say it only from me on as a euro 
European citizen uh, that other policymakers have the we vote in them or we did not, but they are represent, representing us. And it's their also obligation to protect us as the customers for getting product which we which is not transparent and we cannot we cannot uh, get information about this product we cannot decide and it's also uh, this product and if this product is uh, uh, sorry and protect us for getting products which are produced in uh, with this in kind of negative environments with impact on human rights and en environmental rights so basically i think there is also it's like col collaboration of uh, also citizens policymakers brands Every, I think we have to all chip in. Thank you. Okay. I don't know about you all, but I feel very motivated. Um, I know we've gone a little bit over time. There was obviously so much more that we could cover. And unfortunately, we're going to have to close down for this afternoon. But a huge thanks to all of you who are joining us online and a very special thanks to our fantastic panelists. I think it's been an excellent discussion um, and hopefully we'll be able to pick it up again soon. Just to make everyone aware, Fashion Revolution Week events are continuing. So do check out our website and do please get involved. And I hope to see many of you at some other events over the next few days. Um, and with that, everyone take care. And I hope we'll all be connected again soon. Much appreciated.